I will bless the Lord all the time. His praises shall be in my mouth. My soul shall make a boast of the Lord. The humble shall hear their love and be glad. Oh, magnify. Come on. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name. For the Lord is good. I said the Lord is good. He's good on purpose. Come on, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. This is the day the Lord has made. We have come to rejoice and be glad. Amen. Thank you, Bethlehem. Thank you, friends. Thank you, fellow worshipers of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our sight. Amen. It's good to be here. We are in the midst of a good time. In the midst of a real good time. I want to thank all of the preachers who are here. Amen. All of the pastors who are here. All of our sister churches. Just everybody. Thank you so much for this great fellowship. This great fellowship of believers. Amen. So welcome to Big Time Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, if you're first time here, restrooms are downstairs, women is to the right, men is to the left. If you don't make those two turns, you're gonna run into the storage room. We don't want you in there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, women to the right, men to the left. Just enjoy yourself while we're here. Just enjoy yourself while we're here. It's a good old fellowship service. And you know, we used to do this. This, this wasn't a problem. We do this all day. So I just enjoy the fellowship and the strength we get from each other. Amen. Now we're going to let the choir. Um, Get a breather. And our own minister, Kip C. Dixon, is going to come with emphasis on the theme. Amen. Done it 
unto me. Right. And our last scripture, Micah 6 and 8. Read, he has shown thee, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of thee? But to do justly, yeah. and to love mercy, yeah. and to walk humbly with thy God. In Joel 3.16, the prophet speaks of a sign preceding the day of the Lord. It speaks of a time of redemption, recompense, and restoration by the Lord for his people. Although this message is eschatological in context, it is a message of hope for the believer today. Restoration is the process of taking something that has been destroyed or torn to pieces and making it or returning it to its original condition. Regardless as to whether it's Babylonian bondage or bondage to sin, Joel lets God's people know that God, the great avenger, will be a shelter for those that are his. Joel tells us that the Lord tells us what the Lord will do for his people. But then in Micah 6 and 8, we are instructed as to what his people are supposed to do as required by the Lord. God has plainly told us what he demands, and in obedience we must do justly, and are obligated to render to each and every individual what they are due. To wrong no one, and to be right by all. We must love mercy, and just, just to do all we deal with and to be kind to all that need us. And not only must we love mercy, but God's people must also show mercy. We must walk humbly with our God, which means every thought, attitude, and opinion must be brought down in obedience to our God. And when we do these things, we walk in the spirit of servitude. The Lord does not desire that his people walk around in spiritual blindness where we operate in religious rituals or offer empty sacrifices and superficial worship. But he requires a spiritual commitment that comes from the heart and that is reflected in right behavior. There must be a manifestation of who we are as citizens of the kingdom of God and the requirement is fulfilled when we not only discover, but when we walk in our purpose. We reignite the mission when we go back to basics, back to our first love, Jesus Christ. When we gain our passion, our fervor to love, commitment, sacrifice, and concern for those who are hurting, lost, and in order to reach our destination. Matthew 25, 30, 34, and 40 provide the landscape that we must follow in order to reach our destination. It is reflected first and foremost, more foremost in our love for one another. When a spark of compassion lights up the life of someone in need, and in its greatest reflection is in the sign of the cross, which is Christ reaching down to us, and us reaching out to the hurting, to the hungry, to the lost. When we serve a heart of service and drape those in need with kindness, comfort, and concern. When we are a light in darkness as well as a witness as we evangelize the lost. Not only when we seek the lost, but when we cover each other in prayer and the word of God. That's when we do that which the Lord requires of us. God bless you.
and say. And so it is my esteemed honor and privilege to present my friend and my brother. Won't you stand to your feet, Bethlehem, and receive our guest, the Reverend Dr. Keith G. Tyler Sr. from Kentucky State, the man of God. Yeah. 
that's in this house. Now, I know you're wondering a few things about me. And one of them is, can he preach? He seems to talk with somewhat of good diction. But can he preach? Kind of reminded uh, the story of grandfather and grandmother that took their grandson to church. And uh, grandmother was singing in the choir. Grandson was sitting with the father. And the grandmother said, Now, boy, I got two quarters here. It's 50 cents. And she said, uh, I'm going to give you 50 cents to make sure that granddaddy don't fall asleep when the preacher's preaching. I'm going to pay you in advance 50 cents. So she gave him 50 cents and showed up, the choir sung, and Brother Chuck gave the place was on fire, and the preacher got up, started preaching. She happened to look out in the audience and granddaddy was just going at it. And he turned his pew into a comfort inn. He was sleeping away and the more that she looked, the more irritated she became. And so at the end of service, he said, boy, come here. Back in those days, they would grab him by the ear. She grabbed him by the ear and said, what in the world did I tell you? to keep him awake. I gave you 50 cents. She, and he said, yeah, I know, Grandma, but Granddaddy gave me 50 cents not to wake you. <laughs> so, I've got 50 cents up here. Uh, and uh, if you stay awake, I'll give it to you. <laughs> um, right before I get ready, I have I brought with me uh, one of those old media hemp CDs. And uh, I'm going to give it away. Uh, every time I stand, I'll, I believe in giving away um, because your blessing is in giving and not receiving. And I don't know, Pastor Grafton, I don't know who is the oldest member that's present today. The oldest member that's present today. My mother's on this CD. It was recorded live at the church I pastored. A uh, young man who does hip hop music, he underwritten the entire project. Over seventy thousand dollars of equipment was in the church. The mic that I recorded out of was a six thousand dollar mic. This boy had observed how that um, his mother was baptized into my ministry and his children, and he don't do church. His brother and his sister, and uh, he told me, he said, Doc. I heard you talk about a CD, and I'm going to take care of the whole deal because I want to sow it to your ministry. And you missed what I just said. Be careful trying to determine how God's going to bless you. Oftentimes, He makes His bigger footprint outside of organized religion. And so he took care of it. It was recorded in digital. Uh, this is not a Jack Lee. This is top. Top of the top of the food chains, but I want to give this to uh, to the oldest member who is present today, and the reason why I want to do that is because we need to keep our seniors in mind. Yeah. Time's gonna come when you're gonna be introduced to snap, crackle, and pop. You're gonna bend over to tie your shoes, and you'll be introduced to it. Amen. Authorized and all this other stuff. But we need to remember them and those who have paved the way. And so I don't know who's the oldest member, the oldest present today. The mother, who's the mother? Who's the senior present? Where who? In the back? What's what's her name? Mother Kate. Kate. Mother Katie. Let church say amen for Mother Kate.
everybody else at $9.99. That's the, that's the uh, discount price. And the man in the back, Brother Chucky, wave your hand, Brother Chucky, came all the way from Gary, Indiana. Uh, New Mount Moriah Mission of Baptist Church. His pastor is the right Reverend Dr. W. N. Reed. So I want to thank him for coming. Just see him out the church. Amen. I got one more person that's 92. Where's she at? Okay, well then you have one too. Amen. Just read it. What's your name, brother? Nellie? Ellie. Ellie? All right. Ellie Ellis. All right, Mother Ellis. Amen. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brother Fred. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, some of the songs, and I'm going to the text. I know that the hour is near. Uh, some of the hymns on there are. Uh, so glad you came. So glad. So Thank <laughs> you. 
spirit of our ancestors, they still live on. Thank you, musician. Thank you so much. And Acts of the Holy Spirit, notated as Acts of the Apostle, in chapter 12, verse number 1. Then you may be seated and keep your Bibles open. I want to read some more of the text. They taught me in school, don't bite off no more than you chew. Amen. Amen. Chapter 12, verse 1 says, Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to vex, to harass, some of the church. You may be seated. Amen. If you're not too mean, I know I said earlier you wanted if I can preach. I'm wondering if you can pray. <laughs> then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Peter was therefore kept in prison but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out, that night Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers. And the guards before the door were keeping the prison. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison, and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and, be on your, and put on your sandals. Tie them up. So he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. And when they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from and when Peter had come to himself, he said, Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter not at the door of the gate. A girl named Rhoda came to answer. And when she recognized Peter's voice, because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. But she kept insisting that it was so. So they said, it is his angel. Now Peter continued knocking. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. And our last verse for this exegetical exercise, verse 17. But motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, go tell these things. To James 
and to the brethren. And he departed and went to another place. With your amen and your prayers, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, that little man is going to do the best he can to preach and to teach from this thought. Angelology. Angelology. Look at somebody and say, did he say angelology? Stories told of a little old man who went to the doctor and the doctor informed him that his health was failing and that he needed to kick the habit of smoking cigarettes. Now somebody had already tuned me out because I'm talking about your habit. But stick with me, I'm going somewhere. He said, you need to kick your habit because it's detrimental to your health and you're getting older. Right. He went home and he had this, this configuration on his face and his wife said, what's wrong? He said, the doctor has informed me that I need to quit smoking. Yeah. All I have is you, my coffee, and my cigarettes. <laughs> Talk to me someday. <laughs> And she said to him, well, honey, you need to do what the doctor has told you to do. The following day, when he came home, he forgot to go by the corner drugstore to pick up some items. He got home, and when he got home, he said to his wife, he said, you know what, I forgot while I was out to go to the corner drugstore. And honey, you know I like walking at least one mile a day. I'm trying to keep this habit and I'm doing pretty good. She said, well, it's getting late. Why don't you take the car and go to the corner drugstore? He said, no, I think I'll walk tonight. So he took out walking before the sun set and he went to the corner drugstore and sure enough, picked up his items, came out and darkness had now covered the area. He said, it's dark and I know the neighborhood pretty good, so I'm going to take a shortcut and I'm going to go through the alley because I know the area pretty well. Yeah. Went through the alley, mosey on home, sat down, talked to his wife, had dinner, went on to sleep. The next morning when he arose, he was reading his newspaper, drinking his coffee. And all of a sudden, his eyeglasses dropped to the table. And he looked at his wife and said, I can't believe what I'm reading. And there it was on the front page that a man was robbed and killed the same night at the same hour, the same time that he was there. The man's picture, the criminal, was there on the paper and to his discovery was a quick arrest and he said to himself, he said, I've got to go downtown and talk to this man. I'm concerned, I'm curious, I'm inquisitive as to how is it that I was in the same alley, the same time, at the same place. And this man was robbed and killed and I wasn't. So he went downtown and asked could he meet with the criminal and, and the sergeant said yes, but only for a little while. And there he said face to face, he said, Sir, I, I don't mean to trouble you, but I had to come down and see you. And the criminal looked up at him and said, yes. He said, I was in the alley the same night, the same time that you robbed and killed another man. He said, yeah, I know. He said, I saw you first. He said, you did? He said, well, how was it? that I escaped alive and the other man didn't. He said, well, when you lit your lighter, I saw two men behind you. All in. All in. God's got an angel. I wish I had two back as well. somewhat uh, segues us into this particular passage of scripture. 
But before we try to lift just a few feeble thoughts, you and I can identify with angelology. And the devil has tricked us into believing that we should only talk about it during the holidays. But Hebrews teaches me that they are ministering spirits to the saints of God. Aren't you glad that this don't work out for you once a year? But we can identify with angelology because somebody's here. And you recall when you left the stove on, came back home, and all is well. Okay, maybe that's not your story. Maybe you left the keys in the door, went to bed. Not on the inside, but on the outside. Got up the next morning, all is well. Okay, maybe that's not your story. You left your wallet, your purse, and your cell phone. Went back to the same location, whether it was Walmart, Kroger, or the gas station. Someone recovered and retrieved your contents. And to your surprise, all is well, including your credit cards and the $25 here. Come on, talk to me somebody. Angelology. We can all deal with it. We can all relate to it as it pertains to this earthly pilgrimage called life. Ology, angelology, is a two-syllable compound word. Angel means messenger. Ology means the study of or branch of knowledge. Are y'all praying with me? If I was discussing, watch me now, uh, psychology, I will be discussing the study of the mind. If I was to be discussing with you cosmetology, I will be talking about cosmetics. If I was to, if I were to be talking to you about necrology, I will discuss with you the ways and behavior of us folk. But today we're talking about ecclesiology which is the study of church affairs. Let's tiptoe around this text and I'll bid you farewell and we'll all be dismissed. The background of the text will have us to know that the church has exploded. Chapter 11 of the book of Acts informs us that multiple disciples were coming to Christ. Bible study was packed. Sunday school was packed. Let me try it again. Bible study was packed. Sunday school was packed. Let me try my homies to the right, because they're not hearing me to my left. But Bible school, Sunday school was packed. Okay, Sunday, let me come right down and help to the amen. Sunday school was packed. Bible study was all the chain. Now let me come back to my homies on the left. Sunday school was packed. Bible study was off the chain. Well, the book says in Acts chapter 11, verse 26 in particular, that they were first called Christians in Antioch due to the fact of their change of behavior. And I'm learning after 25 years of pastoring, it's not how high you jump when you shout. It's how straight you walk when you land. Because if you're not careful, you can be guilty of jumping around in the salt shaker and still not have any flavor. So in this text, we find that the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is in a teaching mode, which teaches me that preaching brings you out of the world, but teaching brings the world out of you. And could it be, could it be that we want to hear the preaching to have a utopia experience just for a moment, but we don't want to be taught because we're comfortable where we are. So they're in a teaching mode. The church is exploding. And there are growing pains. And we find therein, in chapter 11, where Paul and Silas, God is separating. He said, I got a greater work for them to do. And so we find the launch pad of what you would call the missionary movement of the first century church. And God a good God. 
as the church began to explode, it experienced growing pains. We want the growth without the pain, but no pain, no gain. Are y'all with me here? Watch me. I, the church I pastor, I teach them, you can be a thousand miles in length and only one inch in depth. You can have a packed house with unpacked people. So the church is in, this ain't no shout message, but just follow with me. The church is in a teaching mode. And in the midst of the growth, Satan rises. He lifts his head through the personality of Herod Agrippa I. Now you remember who he is. This king, this brutal king, has issued a man a mass murder hit list on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me here? And you got to be careful about assuming leadership because leaders normally are the ones who get targeted first. I mean, it's like a football game. The one who gets hit all the time is the one carrying the ball. So if you don't want to get hit, quit carrying the ball. We have two personalities here, James and Peter, who've been carrying the ball. And so therein, for those that are making sure that I got my lesson, Pastor Clifford Codwell, the first thing that I see is the improper king. He's improper. Now, you, you got to understand, you got to understand that Herod had to learn that behavior from somebody. He is a part of the seed, the DNA of his grandfather, Herod the Great. You remember him in Luke chapter 1, I believe around verse number 5 in the right Bible. He is the one that issued a hit on all male children two years and under trying to take out Jesus. Somebody might be sitting in proximity next to you and they're a church going folk. You might want to lean over and tell them you can't take Jesus out. Some church folk would love to take Jesus out of the church. There's a hit, amen, that has issued forth a decree declared by his granddaddy that every child is to be killed. And off goes, you know the story, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Uh, Dwight McKissick in his book, Beyond Roots 1 and 2, he argues that particular text, and I don't have time to really deal with it, but he says that he believes that Jesus was a brother. And he goes on to argue, he said, how can you take a white baby with blonde hair to Egypt and hide him and it can be discovered? That's not my press, Amen. So we find that Herod has, amen, his DNA is already corrupt. He's messed up. And I wonder sometimes, brother pastors, I wonder sometimes, Bethlehem District, uh, is it true that we don't have bad kids, we just have bad parents? Where is it that they're learning this behavior? Is it media? Come on, talk to me somebody. I contend that some genealogies, if you're not careful, you'll pass down an evil seed. Yeah. Ask Caitlyn Jenner about it. Come on, talk to me somebody. Here we find, here we find an improper king. And we find, we find that his improper thinking led to his improper behavior. As you think, so you are. The text says here in the opening verses in Amen, Article 8 of this paragraph that James, the first apostolic martyr, is executed. James, the brother of John, is executed. But that's not really what got my attention. I argued with the writer of Acts. I argued with him. I said, I said, help me understand something. Why did Herod do this? Could it be that he was insane? Could it be that he was trying to win the approval of the people to gain favor, amen, for his political maneuvers? Or could it be that he felt the threat of an uprising government or was the man just plain crazy? I contend it was all of them. You know, crazy folk got a whole lot of stuff going on. But then I pressed a little father. I pressed a little father because I still wanted to know something. 
I said to myself, why was it James and not Peter? I wanted to know. I mean, I was just talking to the writer of Acts by myself. I'm just including y'all in the conversation. And I asked him, I said, why was it James and not Peter? He said, well, number one, it really ain't your business. <laughs> because God is sovereign. And God is the one who has life and death in his hands. And he chooses to take whoever he chooses to take and leave whoever he chooses to leave. Are y'all with me? I said, are y'all with me? I've been pastoring long enough to know, amen, that sometimes I say to myself, Lord, why did you take the saint and leave the ant? I said, could it be in my own inquisitive imagination that he took the wrong one and left the wrong one? Because I got some in the church that I pastor, amen, if they go, it's all right with me. Y'all not going to say nothing, but amen, it's not to me. It's not to me. Isn't it strange sometimes those who we think should check out of here live a long time? I might be talking to you, that's why you can't say that. They never get a head cold, amen. They never get sick, amen. And there is somebody who's healthy, full of vigor and vitality, amen. And all of a sudden they check out of here. The old preacher taught me never question God. But it's okay to ask a question. Are y'all talking to me in here? But that's not all, that's not all, that's not all, that's a whole year. Verse 3, the text says that Brother Chucky, when he killed James, when he executed James, the text says in verse 3, it pleased the Jews. Now, Herod, I understand. I can understand. He's a heathen. He had some Jewish connotation, but he's really a heathen. But it pleased the Jews. When one of God's saints was executed. Now help me, brother Deacon. Help me right up here. Right here, help me somebody. Here we have Bible toiling, Bible toiling, prayer going, prayer praying, amen, religious people who go to the synagogue and to the temple week in and week out. As a matter of fact, it's the week of Passover. I mean, they're having an annual feast. A holy week of convocation. Help me preach somebody. And here it is that one of God's children is executed and they're having a party. Somebody's alive right now, amen. And they, amen, are so filled with spite and envy toward you, they would love to hear some bad news about you. But guess what? It shouldn't be the soul of the earth. If there's anybody that should be lifting one another, it ought to be your brother or sister in Christ. Are y'all praying with me? But David is knocking on the consciousness of my mind. And he said, when I went into the house of God, I went with my brother, I went with my sister, and it was not those on the outside that betrayed me, but it was those that I went to worship. Can we just keep it 100? Can we keep it real? Sometimes the church can be fake. Hypocritical. We can't be real. Come on and help yourself. When you Come to church and share with the church what you're really going through. When somebody say, how are you doing? Fine. No. But you can't do it. You feel, amen, helpless. You feel that you can't trust the church. You feel you can't vent. You can't let out. Amen, somebody. And you're never...